if that ever became a serious proposal that was being discussed, I suspect that Quebec might resist that change, going back to its old argument of the protection of the region, to protection of culture and, and language, and thus would argue against having only just the House of Commons. Perhaps the Maritimes, Atlantic Canada, and the West too might argue that if there was only a House of Commons, what is going to counterbalance the huge number of people representing Ontario, it having the largest population, uh, and if Rep by Pop is to reign there, what would counterbalance that for the parts of the, pro parts of the country that don't have as many people? So those would be some of the arguments to say, let's not do abolition. The other part of that discussion is, what would be the formula to get that change if, in fact, they were going to go for abolition? And I mentioned earlier about the Supreme Court of Canada and its ruling. That is going to be part of what they're going to rule on, is what would be the formula, unanimous consent or the 750 rule to bring uh, abolition to the Senate. The second one would be type of reform to the Senate. In the 1970s and 80s, I mentioned there was the whole pressure of the province of regions, or the house of provinces, where the senators would be chosen by their home provinces. And that died out. In 1984, there was a, a report by Mulgat and Cosgrove, who made a recommendation, and I think it had some legs to it for quite a while, where they said that the Senate should be elected, it should be for a nine-year term, and a third of the Senate would come up for re-election every three years, and that you couldn't run again. So, Michael, if you were elected today, you would be there for nine years, and then you're done. But as that would be done, a third each, every three years, would be up for election. I don't think that the government of the day favored that, because it was as if you were going to have a by-election every three years. And those dates would be not on the dates of the elections for the House of Commons, because the fear would be if that happened, you might have a sweep going for the House of Commons, and that same sweep would bring in the same number of whatever party it might be for the House of Commons, and then the Senate. And so the government was not too keen on that whole idea of a nine-year term with re-elections every, or not re-elections, but elections every three years. The veto with regard to that reformed Senate that was proposed by Molgat and Cosgrove, um, it would the Senate would lose its absolute veto and have a suspensive veto of 120 days. So in other words, it could delay legislation for up to 120 days, but it didn't have the absolute control to say no. It had many advantages, and in fact, that's one of the ones that I've studied the most, I think, in terms of what some of the advantages perhaps were First off, the proposal was that the senators would be nonpartisan. So I guess, uh, Mr. Goodell, that would be kind of what Mr. Trudeau is looking at today. The senators would sit in the chamber not representing parties necessarily, but they would be there more as independents. As I say, I don't think, though, the government of the day favored it because of the by-elections every three years. Greg mentioned a little earlier uh, the triple E as another possible reform proposal. Equal, elected, and effective. It came out of Alberta particularly. Many people there were proposing it. Each province would get six senators, so that's the equal. They would still have absolute veto to some extent, but they would have a suspensive veto of 90 days on tax bills and 180 days on other matters. The larger provinces, of course, objected to that. Ontario and Quebec say, well, why would we go to only six seats? And Prince Edward Island, which has a population of less than Regina, would have the same number. And so there was some concern about the equal side of it as well. And yet, you know, interestingly enough, the United States has elected Senate. They have two senators for each state. And the state of California has more population than the country of Canada, compared to North Dakota, it has a very sparse population, each having two. It, well, I was gonna say it seems to work for them, but of the last couple of years, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to say that. Um, 
because there are certainly some uh, examples where I find it very frustrating to watch the American system and their bicameral Congress. But that was the triple E. It lasted for a fair while. They even had the lapel pins and the whole bit. It was quite a campaign. But as you know, it didn't succeed. 1987 was the Meech Lake Accord. And that was, I went to the Senate during that period of time. I went to the Senate, by the way, with a full head of hair. <clears throat> and that's what they did to me. <laughs> and it was interesting during the Meech Lake discussions, the Prime Minister of the day, Mr. Mulroney, agreed not to appoint any senators until a province held an election to choose which senator they wanted to have appointed. Once that election was done, the Prime Minister would then make that recommendation to the Governor General and the appointment would be made. And that did happen in Alberta where Stan Waters, in fact I swore him in when I was clerk of the Senate, and the media kept calling him the first elected senator. He was elected by Alberta, but it really didn't have much standing other than the fact that the Prime Minister then took that name and recommended Mr. Waters to the Governor General and he was appointed under the same process as every other senator has and ha is now being appointed. But as you know, Meech Lake failed, and I won't go into the history of all of that, but again, another interesting part of the history of our country. The next sequel to that, I guess, would be Charlottetown Accord. And I've called the proposal in the Charlottetown Accord with regard to the Senate a two and a half E Senate rather than a triple E. They proposed that it would be equal, it would be elected, but the effective part would be much reduced. In other words, they would not have the same number of powers that they now have. Charlottetown was a compromise. Do you remember all of that debate in the Charlottetown Accord? When I was teaching political studies, I spent a great amount of time talking about the Meech Lake Accord and the Charlottetown Accord. From an academic, it's a fascinating period of time, and, and it's, a, it's a graveyard that I don't think any Prime Minister wants to walk by now uh, in terms of uh, the, the political anguish of the time. But there were 62 points of compromise, and it was agreed to by all of the political parties, the unions, the provinces, the First Nations, and people would say, well, how can it not pass? And yet there was amongst the population some who were opposed and said, that they didn't like it. And the interesting thing about those 62 points, if you were opposed to the Charlottetown, all you had to do was find one point out of the 62 you didn't like, and you'd vote against it, right? But if you were defending the Charlottetown Accord and all 62 points, you had to defend all of the 62 points in order to get agreement. And so that was quite a mammoth task, and I worked very hard while I was, I was in the Senate during that period of time as well, and it, at the beginning it looked like it was going to change, and so we were spending quite a bit of time getting ready for if the Senate was going to be reformed under Charlottetown, what it was going to look like and how it was going to work and all of that sort of thing. And I must admit that I was quite disappointed when it didn't because I thought here is our chance of getting Senate reform. It wasn't perfect, and they were going to make changes even after that. And we were living outside of Ottawa, and we had a flagpole and a Canadian flag. And the night that it didn't pass, I lowered the flag to half-mast. <laughs> and two weeks later, my wife said, Gordon, it's over. Put the flag up. <laughs>